So good to see you again and welcome to uh, today's session. I'll be chairing this session as you've heard. Um, and I will try to be quite strict with time. Uh, I have the absolute pleasure of introducing uh, my friend and colleague, uh, the guest speaker for today, Professor Olutayo Adesina uh, of uh, University of Ibadan. I don't know how to introduce this man, but anyhow, I'll, I'll just try. Professor Lutayo Adesina is a distinguished historian and the current head of the Department of History at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. He's also formerly director of the Center for General Studies at the same university. Professor Tayo and his PhD in history from uh, the prestigious Obafemi Awolowo University in Ile Ife in Nigeria. And he's a recipient of many, many awards and diplomas from various institutions uh, around the world. Professor Lutayo teaches uh, Nigerian history, economic and social history of West Africa, the history of Sub-Saharan Africa, race relations and regional integration. Professor Tayo is a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Letters, the apex organization of humanistic scholarly scholars in Nigeria. He is also an author of tens of works and journal articles, and his most recent and influential read work reads uh, is titled "A Terrain Angels Would Fear to Treat: a bi Biographies of History in Nigeria." Professor Olutayo is the current editor of the African Review, an interdisciplinary academic journal now being published uh, Light and Brill. Professor Tayo, welcome to this session. Please take it away. You have 50 minutes and then will be followed by a Q&A. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Damaris, for the uh, gentle introduction. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon from Nigeria. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, the organizers of the Nigel Institute on Engaging African Realities. It's my pleasure to be here. And it's a topic after my heart. Uh, this is quite important because I come from the Department of History, University of Ibadan. Uh, known worldwide as the Ibadan School of History. And Ibadan School of History was one of the proponents of African historiography. Uh, so we are used to delving into issues uh, on African realities. And so it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, let me, before sharing my screen, let me begin. Uh, by saying that as researchers engaged in uh, qualitative studies, uh, let me provoke your intellectual sagacity by highlighting uh, the following critical questions uh, so that we can put everything in perspective, uh, most especially since uh, they form a fulcrum of what I am going to deal with uh, subsequently. The first question I am going to throw out there is, why do we research? Um, if we don't engage in some of these questions, we will engage in research for research sake and everything will also end up on the shelf and then nobody looks at it ever again. And so what motivates us to research? That's another question. The next one is, what do we research? This is very significant because um, not only scholars have started questioning what we research, but even members of our societies um, have universities remained important to our societies. And the question they ask is, what do you research? What is it useful for? The next question is, 
how do we research? How? Uh, what gaps are you trying to fill? Uh, some people do not actually know what gaps they are trying to fill because they have really not engaged the literature prior to delving into their research. So what gaps are you trying to fill? Then beyond the basic methodological uh, decisions, what is the politics guiding our thoughts and actions? You think in the way we look at things, in the way we craft our topics, in the way we even uh, utilize the resources for research. What is the politics behind what you are doing? Or is there no politics? The next one is what hinders our researching efforts? In other words, what are the barriers? Do we have biases? You know, are we saddled with intro ethnocentric perspective this? Or as James Picard uh, said earlier, evil thoughts. You might think, oh, that's not part of your, your issues, it's not part of the problems. Or as Okelo Ogera also interjected, the holy voices one hears. What are those holy voices? Is this something like, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm? Once you hear that in your field research, what do you do? You know? In other words, what roles do faith and determinism play in all your research endeavors? Are you free from all these prejudices? And finally, what is the social impact of your research? Are these valid questions? If they are valid questions, how do we tackle these questions? If they are not valid, then of course, it means you are free of any kind of prejudice. You are focused, you know where you are going, you know, these are issues that we must consider. And so let me share my screen now for us to delve into uh, the program proper. Okay, so today we are going to look at Understanding the tools and techniques of historical research and writing. Of course, I know the question you will ask is, oh, I'm in theology, I'm in religious studies, I'm in sociology. Why do I need history? What is significant about history that we must bring it in? Is it not one of the antiquarian subjects, dry as dust? useless, you know? And so, do you ever need history in whatever you do? And so I'm going to take us through uh, certain things that allows us to see that we are actually partners in progress. And the reason is this, if you engage in research and your parameters are not complete, then there is a problem is a problem and that is why i have also tried to engage the question of interdisciplinarity meeting you halfway in whatever you do i am not a theologian i am not a pastor but i knew this uh, section of the bible like the back of my hand and I quote, what passion have we in David? And we have none inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tents, O Israel. And now David, see to thine own house 
So all Israel went to their tents. Religious studies to your tents. Literature to your tent. Anthropology to your tent. Oh, I am an, an anthropologist. I don't need literature. I don't need philosophy. Are we going to go back to this epigraph as part of our silos, staying, staying, staying on our lens, our intellectual silos to say, no, I don't have a use for any historical methodology. But I'm also going to show that you needed and still need history more than you think. So the question is, oh, what does theology have to do with history or archival research or historical ethnography? How do archival and historical research complement other approaches in whatever you are trying to do? So my position is that we are all coheres. We are in the same business. We must understand the need for each other. So how do we begin to understand the principles and practice of humanistic research? This is very important in what we do. So as humanistic scholars, just like in every field, we should always recognize the fact that knowledge is always open to critical review. Critical in, in, in review in the sense that we are likely to see certain omissions, certain posturings, certain neglects in whatever you do. And we are free to bring our perspectives in because we can then tell you your parameters are not complete. So your conclusions are deficient. And so our tools of knowledge production should therefore be constantly refined and re-engaged. Oh yeah, I'm in theology, I'm in religious studies, I don't need historical knowledge. Don't forget that when you go to the field and you conduct oral interviews, unless you use, um, um, what do you call it, quantitative methods, the interviews you get will, go, well, it will be narrated. And when you engage in that, when somebody tells you stories, it is part of a historical tool. You still have to go into historical analysis, which is what we do. So there is no way you can move away from history because part of what you do requires historical knowledge. So what do we share as humanistic scholars? That's another question. What do we share? Is there room for collaboration? Most especially since the humanistic disciplines combine normative patterns guided by forms, rules, morals, ethics, culture, religion, politics, historical backgrounds and foundations. All these are embedded in what we do. And so we all share that in common. You know, so does the historical discipline with its tendency to always look backwards, Oh, no, no, we don't need the past in this. If you don't need the past, how do you engage the present and the future? It's a constant part of what we do. You must always engage the past. So if we look at it backwards, of any, how is it of any significance to the present and future scheme of things? So what is history? People will tell you history is, is it not the study of rise and fall of empires? Or the death of one king after the other? You know, we are pigeonholed into something we are not. And then when we educate our colleagues and say, no, perhaps because you have never picked any elective from history, you don't actually understand what we do in history. For most people, they run away from history because they say, oh, I can't cram the dates. Nobody crams dates. Once you understand what you are trying to do, the dates come to you naturally. So what is history? 
history is to be understood as the totality of human experience. That's the simplest definition of history I can give you. And so today when we tell people that, oh yeah, well, we have economic history, we have military history, we have social history, we have intellectual history, we actually also have religious history. Say, hey, is that so? You mean it's not about the rise and fall of empires alone? I say, no. You know, it's one of those things we have to correct. So it is the totality of human experience in the sense that there we talk about rise and fall of empires, yes. We talk about the impact of society, I mean, impact of religion on society, impact of economics on society, impact of philosophy on society. It's everything, it's the totality of human experience. So it is important for you to begin to see history in a different light and from its utilitarian perspective. It is good for whatever you are going to do. So if you don't understand it like that, how do you begin to plan your research that also enables you to integrate all other aspects, all other fields into what you are doing? You know, so while it is good to immerse yourself in the resources from your field, it is also important to recognize other sources available to you. That is very significant. Oh, I mean, sociology, uh, I don't need religious studies. That's not quite true. Oh, I mean, religious studies, I don't need history. You know, if you are in theology, you discover that the entire Bible itself is history. It is history. You know, so it's very important for us to begin to look at this uh, from a broader perspective rather than from our narrow perspective. You know, there are great resources available for humanities scholars and researchers in diverse literatures, museums, monuments, libraries, archives, and ethnographical resources. So don't tell us that, well, I am working on this, I, I can't find sources. Oh, I have run into a cul de sac. And then we tell you, oh, there are resources available in A, B, C, D. You say, is that so? So yes. So these materials are significant and relevant to your studies, maybe hiding in plain sight. But because you have shut your mind against such things, you won't see, you won't recognize it. Or they are buried deep somewhere, and then you need the knowledge of somebody else to draw your attention to them. So don't look for the low hanging fruits because that is the problem we now have with a younger generation of scholars. If you can't see it easily, then it doesn't exist. And that is the difference between the older scholars that I have always loved to call the hippopotamus generation and younger scholars, the cheetah generation. They want everything done, not today, not tomorrow, but yesterday. Or oh, they engage in a research and writing, and within one week, they are done with their writing. And of course, they don't want to give their writings to somebody else to read, no peer review. You know, and so we, we, we are sustaining a huge tragedy in our intellectual efforts because um, you are trying to beat a deadline and so anything goes. No, but research is painstaking. It's a slow process. It's an effort that you must engage in to the best of your ability and to ensure that you get the best out of everything you do. So good research needs painstaking and substantial work. I was reading the comment of um, somebody on Monday and he or she was asking uh, for how long will you stay in the field if you are engaging in, in ethnographic research? For as long as it is necessary. Don't say, oh, I am spending one week. 
uh, recently there was um, a, a Zoom program I joined and the, and the researcher was saying, well, he has spent one week at the archives in Ghana and he has not been able to see anything. One week in the archives? Oh no, before you begin to see anything, perhaps two months. So don't be in a hurry, don't rush to get as much as possible. And I'm going to show you when we get to the archival section that even if, when you find materials in the archives, you still have to double back, to double check from other sources to ensure that what you have seen is reliable and can be utilized. Oh, you think, oh, because it was written by a missionary, then it must be sacrosanct. Or it was written by a professor, then of course, as we used to say in mathematics, cured erat demonstrado. Oh, no questions. So, is that the way we do research? Good research needs painstaking and substantial work. And so this should take you out of your comfort zones. We all love our comfort zones. Um, I, I knew somebody who ran into trouble because yes, he published substantially and then they denied him promotion. And I was asking our seniors what the problems were. And they said, have you ever read any of his works? I said, no. You will discover that yes, there are several topics, several fascinating themes, but he sat at his table and used the same literature for the different themes, different topics, but the same literature for the research he was engaged in. And so move out, get new literature, get up to the literature. Don't just sit at your library and continue to move around the same literature because you are in a hurry to publish. Yes, there is a publish and perish. Uh, Professor Adogame had referred to it one time, publish and perish. What we knew was publish or perish. But you can publish and perish because you regurgitate the same materials. You are dancing around the same thing. You have 30 publications, but we can collapse it into one publication. That's publish and perish. So are you one of those engaged in publish and perish? Well, in addition, um, think through and define your concepts. At, at times you look at your concepts and decide, well, this is what I am interested in, but have you gone through the science and politics of those concepts? Because writing is, is also a mode of thinking and cultural posturing. One could become nuanced and thereby lay the grounds for tendentious scholarship with your concepts. So have you defined your concepts to the best of your ability and to the extent to which you will not be accused of posturing? The next thing you will then have to do is to move away from uncritical use of materials. So you will, Oh, this speaks to what I'm working on. Because it has said this one, I'm going to use it. So you do not see the lacuna in such materials. You must be able to critique the materials you are using for your work. Don't take everything hook, line, and sinker. And then, of course, you have to decolonize your thinking. And people ask, what is this decolonization you're always talking about? Decolonize your thinking. Do you think that the way you see things is devoid of imperial posturing? And by the time, if we talk about imperial, it doesn't mean foreign alone. There is local imperialism. It's local imperialism. So decolonize your thinking in every respect. You know, this is because good research and good writing go together. It is imperative that you understand that good research and good writing go together. You might have good research 
and have bad writing. You might have bad research and good writing, but immediately we see, we know that there is, there is a gap or it's tendentious. So understand how you can marry good research and good writing. Well, somebody raised a question about whose reality are we talking about? Um, there, there is always this posture or posturing that the global academy is one. And so whatever is done in Africa should actually uh, be able to interface what, with whatever is going on in the United States or in Europe or Asia. Yeah, that's true. But we still have our reality. We have a reality. So what's the reality? In Africa, the current post-colonial discourse on ethnic, cultural, or ra racial identities have come to query, reject, repudiate, and in very minor cases, affirm earlier ethnographic data derived from Arab and European travelers, missionaries, explorers, soldiers, colonial administrators, and even casual visitors and scholars who wrote widely about state and society in Africa. Now, some of your uh, resources might depend for, uh, uh, on the CMS records. Are you engaging the CMS records critically? Are we pagans? You know, so the discourse, either from your materials or from your own position, must understand discusses around what I have identified. So because many researchers have come to rely on such materials for our research, critically or uncritically. Um, we need to re-engage some of this literature because I mean, all documents, materials, because that's what we have. Even when you go to um, oral sources, oral tradition, we still have to engage these materials critically. Oh, because an old man said so. He was there, and so he was in a position to know what happened. Where will you put interpretation? Because it's part of what we do. You two people can be at the spot, witness the same event, and yet interpret them differently. So don't think because the person or the missionary was an eyewitness account then, of course, everything he or she had written must be understood and taken hook, line, and sinker. And so um, every generation of academics, uh, a time lapse between one research team and another is enough to impose new realities and questions. Um, you can be working on the Nigerian civil war, for instance, uh, use materials and eyewitness accounts of the 1970s and 80s. But we tell you that that might not be enough. And it's one of the things keeping historians uh, employed, for instance. This is because you, have the right to critique previous works based on new materials, new documents, new information. I mean, several instances as historians, we begin to see uh, declassified documents that shed new light on something somebody had written 30 years earlier. So you as scholars in the humanities must also understand that, that the fact that uh, we redo or the fact that um, um, Olodumare, God in Yoruba, I believe, had been written you know, by a scholar of note, then of course, whatever he has said is on a syllabus. So we begin to see all these things because every generation would 
have new materials, new resources, new understandings to critique previous works, the earlier works, in the light of new evidence. And so, still looking at the reality of the African, Africa is a huge and complex continent. The continent and its colonial experiences and diversity have determined to a large extent the nature of the states and societies. So, oh, because you have um, actually read about oh, the Kikuyu, yes, you can then transpose whatever you have there into the Yoruba situation. Or because one French territory uh, mirrors what happened in another French territory, then of course we can you know, project whatever has happened in one into the other. It's, it's not like that. So don't assume that because uh, you have read some materials and they sounded like what you needed, then you just lift it and use it to do your own analysis. It doesn't work that way. This is because there is a complexity attending the African situation that we must recognize. So as the nation or continent arrives at a point of rupture, there is a tendency to create some tension between the past and present experiences and reality. So don't always assume that because um, the past had been apprehended, had been captured beautifully, then of course that is the way you must always look at it. As scholars, of religion, as scholars of history, of anthropology, of sociology, you have to look at the rupture in the way things work. You know, so that rupture normally gives room for new contexts and structures to emerge that influence the development of a new of new ways of knowing what we know. New ways of knowing what we know. Um, in the past, uh, historians don't use um, theories, we don't use concepts, we, don't, we just write our stories, you know, and narrativity was the most important part of it. But now they tell you, no, um, there must be critical analysis, there must be concepts, there must be use of, if you're an economic history, uh, uh, theories, things have changed. And so for every generation, you have to understand the reality on ground to say, well, we have to look at it from a different perspective. So researchers actually need to be a bit more critical in their adoption and application of tools of analysis, of materials, of understanding how things went down. You know, in order to get a meaningful understanding of state and group behavior, for instance, the use of multidisciplinary methodology is sine qua non to the understanding of issues and processes surrounding the understanding of the continent. So don't say, well, uh, I am in religious studies, so I'm in history, um, I can go it alone. You know, things have changed for the historian who didn't need anthropology because uh, at the Bogibada School of History, initially we didn't use anthropology because we regarded them as as handmaidens of imperialism. But as time went on, we began to see that there was even a closer relationship between history and anthropology than between history and sociology. So, so right now, we are closer to anthropology than to sociology. Yet in the days of the really bad school of history, anthropology was an enemy. That was our generation. That generation looked anthropology because the colonial administration, the imperialists were always using uh, anthropology to affirm a position, a posturing they didn't like. And the Bada School of History was at the forefront of seeing things within the context of African historiography. And so that became a problem. But now we are closer to anthropology. So that's what I say when we talk about the generation you know, in the critical adoption and application can also be a generational thing. So understanding the cultural and linguistic con contraptions contained in the social space 
must also be studied critically. And I'm going to show you an example about this subsequently because there are nuances, there are silences, there are posturings. I love to give the example of our mothers in those days. If she puts food on the table and she's in the bathroom and you saw the food, you wanted to have a taste of it or even consume everything, you shout to your mother across the divide and say, mommy, can I eat this food? The way she answers you, unless you know the nuance, the nuances, you might run into trouble. And it comes with the cadence of the tone. In, in Yoruba, it, it is J, but J is positive. But there is also an angle in which it becomes negative. It's the, written the same way, you know, same spelling. And she says, J, which is affirmative, J, eat it. But if she says, J, you are in trouble. Eat it and let me see. Eat it and you run into trouble. So those cadences are part of those things you also watch out for when you are in the field. Uh, when you are interviewing people, you also look out for the body language, you look out for the cadences, you try to also understand the word behind the word. That's our reality. So there are times when, yes, even when you speak in English, there is a way in which uh, transliteration helps us to hide certain positions. So unless you are also attuned to this, your conclusions are likely to be affected in this regard. So you must understand the cultural and linguistic constructions contained in the social space. I am not saying that if you are not an African, you cannot research Africa. That's not my, not my position. I am just talking specifically to you people who are researching on Africa and then of course be mindful of some of the things you have to understand while on the field. And so you must always refer to the context in which your work is taking place. Yeah, we use Western methodologies, we use Western approaches. Do we have to use all this every time? Is it relevant for what we are doing? These are issues. So always understand the context in which your work is taking place. And so um, to make a success of your research in the contemporary period, students and scholars working within the specific fields must be inducted into interdisciplinary perspectives. So you, 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 you cannot go it alone in this day and age. It's not, it's not just possible. Or else, of course, your conclusions are going to be deficient. And of course, yeah, you say, well, what does it matter? It doesn't matter if you don't want to be a scholar, but if you want to be a scholar, your work must be credible. Credible not only in your field, but across your field. And so what do we then do when you come across African knowledge systems? Do you condemn it vis-a-vis the global knowledge system, or you look at it within the context of our reality to say, well, this is what we have from the field. This is what it means. Uh, this is where, how we have to look at it. And this is how we have to interpret it. You know, yeah, it's good to understand globality. It's good to understand how to speak to the global systems. But of course, you have to understand the local reality. And so your research should therefore be understood as a collaborative process. Uh, remember that Candoval in Latin America, for instance, contains both Christian icons and traditional processes that needs collaborative approaches to decide. Yeah, because there are certain things, iconography, wordings, that you will need the experiences of others to identify 
This is very significant. So in Africa, there have been growth and mutations over the years. So at times, what you see is not what they are. It's not what they are. These are things you must understand. Or, or if you want me to use the, the cliche, the more you look, is the less you see. So what are those things that you are seeing? Because you have seen them that way, is it going to be interpreted that way? You need other disciplines. You need other knowledges to be able to get to the root of what you are working on. And that's why I said research is painstaking. It's a, it's a painstaking process. Don't just go straight to the press. Immediately you see this to say, Eureka, I found it. You know, and of course, um, our religious formations now contain accretions and syncretic matters. Which one is the original? Which one is syncretic? Many of the new religions in Africa have therefore been re-symbolized and have tended to take on new meanings very fast. I'm sure if Abba Jafar comes alive now, he might not even be able to recognize the celestial church of Christ. Because of course, things have moved around, been re-symbolized, and in some cases, be reconfigured to take care of the needs of the present generation. So if you wrote a book on the Celestial Church of Christ 20 years ago, do we still have the same position 30 years later? You know? And of course, you continue to encounter the lazy trope of Africa as a country and with the images of starving children and livestock representing the false lines of researching and on Africa. These are things we are usually uh, confronted with every day. So leads to my question, what is the social impact of your research? Are you also going to repeat what we had always seen or what some people had pushed out? Because of course there is a, a, there are hegemonic issues in publications, in publishings, in writings. And so because yes, they were there, oh, they had the funding, the resources to do this, it must be true. What is your own position? How are you going to define within the context of the resources available to you, some of the information that had gone on in the past? So understanding the past and its uses becomes significant in whatever you do. Uh, the role of the past or how history should reveal and retrieve facts, evidence, proofs, and truths from the past is central to making use of the past. In whatever you do, always cast your mind at what went on in the past. How is it influencing the present? How is it likely to influence the future? You know, so it's very significant for you to bring history on broad, no matter what you do. What is missing from earlier works? that you are proposing to update is part of the history we are talking about. Because as you also do your literature review, you are also delving into history. So simply because we didn't call it historical review, your literature review is historical review. Because if you don't delve into the literature of the past, then how do we know that what you are going to contribute is significant? So, Everything is history, everything. Your knowledge, your existence, your desires, is history because it came out from something somewhere. And that talks about substructure upon which you build the superstructure. What you are doing is the superstructure that you are trying to construct the substructure is what had gone on in the past that you are leveraging on to bring up your own superstructure. So a new researcher should utilize previously unused or little used archives and a wide variety of sources and resources to address extant issues of continuities and change in Africa. That's one thing we have seen in history. History is about continuity and change. It's not static. And so if you are going to engage in good substantial scholarship, you have to understand these continuities and change. 
and it has to be done from a historical perspective. You know, so materials that you are going to leverage on would also include memoirs, travel accounts, newspaper articles, etc. And these materials should be handled in both scholarly and objective manner. When you read certain newspapers, there are editorial posturings and positionings. Oh, if you belong to one political party and these newspapers talked about that political party, you know, you understand clearly the editorial policy of that newspaper. It differs from the editorial policy of the next newspaper. So, all these materials also have their own politics. When somebody writes a memoir, there are memoirs that are significant, there are memoirs that are highly sanitized, and I'm going to show you uh, subsequently. So is it possible to identify the extent and nature of safety relationships between the time of, of a material, the time a material was produced and the present? Of course, um, a material that was produced 30, 40, 50 years ago has its own tendencies. And of course, like I said, there are new materials, new evidence, new information that will also allow you to begin to critique the previous works from that perspective. So um, relationships are at one point characterized by warmth and mutual relationship, while at the others by tension, frictions, and misunderstandings. So um, some of these materials you are going to, to read, and that's why we also have revisionism in history. Um, uh, if you are agreeable with the community, with the society, uh, the material you are likely to read on that will be different from the material produced when there was friction. So you've got to interface all the materials to understand what went down. And so I'm going to show you one video and then later give you the analysis of different people who saw this video uh, differently. A masquerade went into the church, Catholic church, to do thanksgiving. Was it syncretism? Was it occultism? You are free to define it the way you want. And so let us use this as an example of what I've been talking about, about African reality, who oh, the Catholic church um, would tell you, you could not even use African drums because they were fetish when we were growing up. I was an altar boy, you know? And so you could not use African drums because they were fetish, but subsequently it began to come in. But in our days, we never brought the masquerade into the church, but now there's a masquerade in the church. So things are changing at a fast tempo that we must begin to apprehend as scholars, you know? Um, what is, um, is a quick time not available? Is it, it's not possible to play this? Uh, uh, Nelly? Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. I, I'm, if, I don't know. If we have the URL, it's possible to just click on, on it from the website. Do we have that? Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, let me see. Otherwise, you can fast forward and then we, we sort it out and you can you can play the next time if it's possible. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, because all the all the interpretations that went after mm -hmm. was the actually, uh, how do I remove the the um, information on the sites? Uh, um, okay. uh, if, if we know where you downloaded this from, then okay. we, just, we just copy the... The URL. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let me let, let me see. Let me see. I, I think I also have it 
on my my yeah. so, 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 so. yeah i'm just looking at the time because you have uh, about 10 yeah. minutes left for this yeah. okay 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 i think tunde tunde got it now so uh, ah okay okay is it possible to click on it? Uh, okay, let's see. Well, it's, well, it's still telling me quick time not available. I think it's yeah. still the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, so let, let me just give you the school range in Catholic Church. Okay, so do I... Yeah, I could link. Yeah, I, I think people can click on it. Let okay. the people you just uh, click on that uh, on that link, and it will take you to the video. Okay. Yes. Let them do that. It, it's three minutes. It's three less than four minutes a video. So let them screen it, and then okay. uh, you can just uh, do your analysis of it. Ah, okay. Okay. Is it going to be done at your end? Yes. Okay. Okay. It's good. I think uh, people can do that right away. Okay, okay, it's good. Come on. Okay, so well, well let, let, let me continue where while we are sorting that out. And so um the the masquerade in the church has elicited different um, interpretations. Um, and, and I'm trying to show this because uh, as scholars, we are going to meet with diverse interpretations. You are interviewing this, you are learning from this, and then you begin to meet with the, by diverse perspectives. And at the end of the day, you, you, you begin to ask yourself, what is happening? Oh, the world is coming to an end. Is that your conclusion? You know, um, and the first interpretation tells us this is traditional music in a church, not only just music, but together with an accomplishing masquerade, even the priests and nuns dancing and celebrating the masquerade. For, for, for this lady, it was an anathema, a masquerade in the church. But this is another interpretation uh, trying to say, no, it wasn't some a big deal. It was even a reverend sister who encouraged uh, the masquerade to come into the church. Uh, you know, um, the man in the masquerade was not brought from a Jewish shrine. That makes it right. The man is a baptized Catholic and a communicant. That makes it right. In fact, it was simply a drama and nothing syncretic about it. This is another position. So how do you begin to understand the divergence of positions. Then interpretation three, you know, was trying to say, well, yeah, the personality in Gab is a member of the church. It happened in Andamawa State, the Catholic judge just doing his own thing locally. You know, it was his own elder sister, a reverend sister, final profession task giver. In those days, it was unthinkable that a, a reverend sister will think of bringing a masquerade into the church. Then interpretation four, you know, talks about enculturation, which has long been part of entertainment, enculturation. Is this part of enculturation? You know, the questions are arising, how far do we go as far as enculturation is concerned? We are still talking about part of African reality. What practices fit in and which do not? These are issues. And this one was even uh, from a reverend sister and interpretation five by a lay person uh, was talking about, um, yeah, even uh, going back to, to Crowder, that if any activity is not immoral or indecent, tending to corrupt the minds but merely an innocent play for amusement, it should not be checked because of its being naive and of heaven origin. So even, even Crowder said it. 
So you begin to see diverse perspectives. So what's your politics? What's your position in this case? Then interpretation six, by Professor Odeli Laiwala at the University of Ibadan was talking about these things be, were part of the Christian activities from time immemorial. I was talking about when they were young with them at Christmas. You know, you could call it a book. You know, in fact, Christmas was never complete without these harmless heaven expressions. So you begin to see, oh, from Rome, it will be condemned. From Africa, we don't see anything wrong with it. So in your analysis, are you going to take the position of Rome or are you going to take the position of Africa to say, no, it's our reality? So these are issues. Then interpretation seven, um, which was from the Reverend Father in Ibadan here was talking about um, our mass is our common patrimony, it belongs to all of us. If the mass is celebrated in such a way that people begin to wonder if this is still the mass, then something is wrong. That's his position. He said, no, you have ruined Catholic Church. So we could see diverse positions on a single episode, a single incident. So that takes us to responding to Africa's research needs. When you realize, two okay, two minutes yeah, from, well, yeah. Uh, okay. So what I have said now speaks to Africa's research needs. What are you doing? What is uh, the social impact of your research? Is your research relevant? Does it have to be relevant or is just basic research? Uh, if it's basic research, okay, fine, that's good. But if it's grounded research, then you begin to look at issues from a diverse perspective. So do we need to respond to Africa's research needs or we need to respond to global research needs? You know, African scholars are now expected to be change agents, scholars, professionals, activists, and development practitioners have become imbued with a keen interest in Africa's transformation. How do you begin to engage in African transformation if you don't understand African reality? This reflects the increasingly important need to understand the African experience in its interlocking dimensions. So research and publications are now to provide the platforms for discussions and networking for leading and younger scholars, researchers, development experts, professionals, policymakers, postgraduate students, and others interested in the past, present, and future of Africa. I stop here. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Prof, uh, for that nuance conversation on researching African realities. Um, and I just really love how you drew the multidisciplinary perspective in which we can engage on this research. Thank you. I think I want us to give him a very big um, African clap. <laughs> okay. So if you mute your, if you unmute yourself, uh, we'll do a very, very good clap for him. Yay. Thank you. That's quite wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. So, so I, th I think uh, we have about 20 minutes for a QA. and a And uh, so keep the questions coming. Um, you could write on the chat, but you could also just raise your hand and I will pick you. Um, so, um, hmm, hmm. So there is, there is one question, Prof, here that says, uh, is there a religion that is not syncretic? Um, yeah, so you, you, you could just answer that as I look for other questions. Mostly these are okay. comments. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely none. But as I have read out from uh, one position there, uh, the syncretic nature must not be evil. So for some people, um, bringing an egogo into the church was evil, <laughs> you know. But you know, in other instances, yeah, syncretism is part of of religion. Uh, and don't forget that the whole issue of um, of uh, the Fulani jihad of 1804 in Nigeria, for instance, had to do with the purification of Islam of its accretions and syncretisms. So 
do we, the question is, do we still have a pure religion? That's the issue. And so part of what propels Islam, for instance, today is that it doesn't want those syncretic part of it. it. Wants to go back to the original religion. The same way the last Reverend Father saw it, to say if we no longer are able to celebrate mass the way we used to know it, then of course everything is destroyed. So yeah, you are right. The 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 uh, every religion is syncretic, but it must not be an accretion of evil, evil in quotes, so to speak. Thank you. Um, there is a question from uh, Okelo. Thank you, Prof. Adesina, for an illuminating presentation. My question is on whose reality? Reality is a matter of perception. What is reality for someone in Africa may not be real for a European. How does this feed into the debate on credibility of the real globally, locally, and locally? Well, we are not talking so, about European <laughs> reality. Yeah, right. the European reality is European reality. African reality is African reality. Credibility according to whose book of words? You know, I was, I mean, listening to the presentation yesterday and um, the, the lady from Malawi also was talking about, which is part of uh, the ethos of research nowadays, um, anonymity in, in research. Uh, you don't have to put the name of your respondents, just say, well, this is, and of course it's going to cause a crisis later on because people will just sit in their homes and begin to, to create interviews in their head and say anonymous. We are going to run into trouble very soon. But in those days as historians, we uh, base everything on credibility. Is the man still alive? The man you interviewed, the woman you interviewed, do we have an address for her? You know, but when you make it anonymous, the way things are going now, uh, by the ethos of research and the ethics of research, um, well, well, even before, before now, I, I remember there was a, a, an MA student in another, another university who conducted a very beautiful interview. And the supervisor said, oh, this is wonderful. I'd like us to do a follow-up to this interview. Let's together go and see the man you interviewed. And the student said, well, um, the man died the following, the following day after the interview. So, so you begin to see all these kind of things subsequently. So um, yes, it is good for us to engage research the Western way, but we also have to be mindful of certain realities about research in Africa. We want to see, we want to know, we want to understand, we want to engage, we want to re-engage. But when you then say an, uh, anonymous, how does that help me as somebody who wants to do a follow-up research on what we have done? So no, we cannot continue to talk about European reality or American reality. Africa has its own realities. And so we must understand whatever you do within that context. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, one more question from uh, uh, Joel Carpenter. Human experience as it changes over time, change, development, movement across time are essential drivers of historical inquiry, no? Historians typically ask, how did this come to be? Where did this come from? Critical questions for understanding anything in front of us. Not sure whether that's a question, but uh, you, you, you could it's a comment. just respond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a comment and that speaks to what I have been saying. Yeah, that's it. Um, it it's important for us to, to re-engage history in whatever we do, because that propels you to also ask further questions. But, if you don't engage the historical aspect of what you are doing, then of course, you are likely to have something that is a little bit too, too inadequate. You know, so yes, I, I, I love that position. Uh, yes, uh, Prof, I said that uh, just a side comment earlier in your talk and you got to that point. Yes. I mean, that's, that's uh, historians, that's kind of our, our trump card with, with uh, people of other disciplines is you really don't know your subject unless you know its origins. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. What, what, you know, one concrete example, there's, there's been this debate in um, looking at contemporary uh, Pentecostal charismatic manifestations in Africa, you know, and so someone like Paul Gifford would say, well, this is extroversion. This is African simply, um, 
and in his mind, pathetically taking on uh, things with North American characteristics. But, but other African scholars, uh, you know, we think of our friend uh, Kwabana at Trinity and Legon saying, no, no, this is deeply African Christian or, or religious sensibilities coming to the fore. Uh, in some cases, ironically, uh, with people who would want to demonize all that's come before. Um, uh, but uh, it's, you know, it's taken historians, I think, to go back and look at uh, the, the early reception of Christianity in places like Ghana or Nigeria and to say, um, Africans accepted this faith on their own terms, and it, it uh, had many Pentecostal characteristics from the very start. So historians can help with questions like that. Yeah, absolutely, that's that's what I'm recommending. That no no man is an island. Um, it it can only uh, ennoble uh, your research more when you, when you engage uh, historicity and historical um, analysis to, to look at what you are working on. That's, that's really very, very important. Yes, thank you. Yes, um, one more question, then we break for a short break. Uh, this is from Mate. I thought provoking presentation, Prof Tayo, may I be the devil's, uh, I think, advocate? What is the pressure <laughs> need to bring, uh, need for bringing the masquerade, masquerade. into the church? <laughs> Well, um, that's part of um, what I'm going to give you as an assignment. You have to track down those people and then, of course, ask them the question, why, why did you have to do that? Uh, can't you just um, uh, screen the masquerade and come and show us uh, uh, on celluloid in the, in the church to say, well, this is what we are using uh, to celebrate. That's, that does not, that's not as evil so to speak, in inverted commas, as bringing the masquerade into the church. And, and uh, of course the question is, okay, why, why not? Why not they have said the masquerade is not evil, it, doesn't, it didn't come in with any fetish thing, it's just grass, you know, and so, and, and God made grass. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, we have a number of, uh, comments and questions uh, in our chat. And I think, Prof, you can continue to have this conversation with the grantees. Um, thank you so much once again. I'm clapping for you. And I hope everyone is joining me in clapping again. Um, I you. think I've really, really enjoyed that. Um, now we're going to go for a break unless um, Afe or Nelly has something to say for 15 minutes, then we reconvene again after our coffee break. No, thank you, thank you, Damaris, and thank you, Tayo, for that uh, brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, okay. Just for the benefit of those who could not preview the video, during the break, you will have a chance. We we'll put it up so that you can see how a masquerade, you know, uh, is trying to <laughs> to masquerade in the church. Thank you. It's a it's a Christian masquerade. <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> so there will be uh, the countdown. We will have the, the time countdown as well. So look out for the time countdown and uh, let's recon uh, in 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 